welcome to all of you uh, to this opening session of Sunday at the Abbey. Uh, we're thrilled to have a distinguished panel this evening of Sister Teresa Schumacher, Sister Catherine Kraft, Father Simeon Thole, and Father Jerome Tupa. I'm going to give you a short introduction for each of them. Uh, Sister Teresa made first vows at St. Ben's on July 11th, 1957, just after the council was called. Uh, she taught in grade school and high school. She studied liturgy at Notre Dame, and she has done liturgy in the flesh on the front lines for a whole lot of years at St. Ben's, both in terms of planning, but also in terms of leading it as a musician. Her work was at Notre Dame. She is now an associate director or planner with Studium, uh, which is a place of study and research for scholars on the St. Ben's campus. Sister Catherine Kraft made first vows at St. Ben's Monastery on July 11th, 1959. Um, she's a teacher by profession. She taught for many a number of years, nine years, at Cathedral High School. She also did campus ministry at St. Cloud State University and the College of St. Benedict. She's done advanced degree work in theology and spirituality um, uh, and uh, has uh, also taught undergraduate theology. She also served the community of St. Ben's as sub-priors. Um, Father Simeon followed the classic path of entry into St. John's through prep school and the college and into, into the monastery in 1955. His training as a monk and a priest predates the council because he was ordained in 1962. He taught and prefected for many years at St. John's Prep. Uh, I tried many times to score baskets over Simeon. Um, <laughs> he served as chaplain and pastor and was appointed apostolic administrator of St. Leo Monastery uh, in, in St. Leo, Florida for five years. And he's now in our spiritual life program. And finally, Jerome Tupa began his monastic life here at St. John's in the middle of the council in 62 or so, plus or minus, okay? And lived as a non-ordained monk here in this monastery until 1982. He first worked as a teacher of French, and then earned a doctorate, taught French for many, many years, uh, uh, pursued ordination, and was ordained in 1982. And after that, his vocation as an artist uh, asserted itself, and he painted with color, energy, and passion. And in the last seven to eight years, his pastoral gifts have emerged. I thought it would be interesting and helpful for us as two communities, and uh, on this occasion, within a few days of the 50th anniversary of the second opening of the Second Vatican Council, to pose this question, and in the first person, um, what have been the most lasting and fundamental changes in the church and in monastic life that came out of Vatican II. Please give a warm Collegeville welcome to our panelists. And I'm gonna ask the panelists to go in terms of Teresa, then Catherine, then Simeon, then Jerome, okay? And then uh, we'll open it up for uh, further reflections, questions, clarifications, et cetera, okay? Thank you. Well, thank you, Abbot John. And um, when I looked at this focus question, I thought, well, you know, I was playing the organ when I was in fifth grade, so I know a lot about uh, pre-Vatican uh, as well. And um, was in the choir, you know, kind of kept the church going on Saturdays and so on. But with Vatican II, the excitement about change, I just can't tell you how much excitement was in myself and in our community. A great hope for the church. Um, we began to be the people of God. That is, you know, on pilgrimage, the people of God. And I felt a very great hope for women because I heard this phrase, the priesthood of the baptized. And you know, that goes a long way. And I had a lot of hope 
for Benedictines because we were reclaiming our charism and especially uh, around the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, Eucharist, yes, but Liturgy of the Hours uh, was kind of um, Latin, uh, open your book, turn the pages, you know, do the, go down the, and just keep turning the pages and do your duty, kind of. I, we didn't have a lot of uh, preparation for psalmody or uh, for the spirituality of the Liturgy of the Hours. So I was very happy to um, read and study the uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. Well, my response uh, is probably going to not sound like I'm into the liturgy thing, but I really am. Uh, probably at the top of my list is the mystery of the Incarnation, Jesus becoming human. As Irenaeus said, you know, the glory of God is a fully alive human being in the flesh, as Jesus chose to be. And uh, the other big thing that I think is related to in the flesh, incarnation, is Genesis 1. And God saw that it was good. That whole thing about creation being redeemed and all of uh, creation, you know, being part of our worship, our life. And I just want to say, uh, you know, how this incarnation thing struck me in a class I took from Godfrey Diekman. It was a patristics class. It was in the early 80s. And um, I found out on day one that uh, the first, you know, my notes, I was taking notes, but I found out on day one that I had to do this down the middle uh, because he would say some things about patristics but mostly about Vatican II, because he was a Pariti, you know. And he told all these stories that were just wonderful. But I remember him expounding, and this came out of, I think, the, um, you know, uh, remember uh, the psychiatrist Ernest Beckford, uh, who wrote about the denial of death in the 70s? And I think people were starting to read it and all and, and really getting into this thing about, uh, you know, maybe everything's here and we should just be happy and joyful and uh, maybe not think about the Paschal mystery the whole bit. We were just kind of thinking about the resurrection and the alleluias, right? Well, uh, the Paschal mystery is suffering and dying and living and suffering and dying as well, isn't it? Well, this is Godfrey Diekman in response to that. He's with his typical energy, accompanied by a thunderous pounding on the wooden desk. He said, it's the car incarnation, damn it. So um, having that uh, pounded into me as well, <laughs> I found that, you know, that's really, really where it's at. And so uh, as I looked at the, uh, I thought I'd bring in a couple of articles from the documents. I found this one that uh, clearly calls the liturgy to be incarnational. It's Article 30 of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. It reads like this. To promote active participation, the people should be encouraged to take part by means of acclamations, responses, psalmody, antiphons, and songs, as well as by actions, gestures, and bodily attitudes. A lot of incarnation in there, isn't there? And, of course, we're all supposed to observe a reverent silence at times. That's incarnational, too, isn't it? To see if we can stop our body from uh, doing so many things. Anyway, all of that made me think of the sacraments, you know, the sacramental life, how the reforms and um, 
the renewal of the rights. So now we have listening to the word. Well, these all take place in the assembly, which I'm going to talk about a little later, but listening to the word, singing, touching, immersing in water, slathering in oil, if you were confirmed after Vatican II, you probably uh, knew it, huh? Or if you were anointed on the, you know, you really get it. And um, tracing the cross. We trace the cross on our bodies. Um, we do it. The minister does it. Uh, when people are sick, head, shoulders, uh, heart, feet, you know, really incarnational. We have processions, and uh, we dance, and we eat and drink and lay on hands, and so on. You can go through the sacramental rites, and you see all this incarnational stuff, which says we are human uh, as Jesus became human, and it is through that kind of humanness that we are brought into the divine Another article, I don't know my timing, who's watching me? Okay, um, that I want to talk about because I want to talk about the primacy of the assembly. That's probably the other big thing that has um, affected me or, or um, been very big in my life. Article seven of the Constitution talks about the manifold or the multiple presences of um, Christ in the Eucharist. And Sister Mary Anthony Wagner loved this idea. She, uh, that Christ is present, not only in the minister or the priest, but also in the Eucharistic species, in the word proclaimed and in the assembly, the church gathered. And when Bob Havda talked to us, in our community just before, well, as we were doing our planning for the uh, renovation and building of the new sacred spaces on, uh, at St. Benedict's. Well, he gave us a talk on the primacy of the assembly, and I'll tell you, it really opened it up to each other. And as we were thinking about putting the altar under the dome, you know, all these pews, ended up all around, and we are sitting wherever we go. We're face to face. If you've been to our oratory, we're face to face. We look each other in the face. We, um, uh, the spaces are, uh, you know, we can't really hide or sneak out or sneak in. Uh, it doesn't work. So anyway, uh, the principles of uh, the primacy of the assembly, you know, went through all the renovations and so on. I know I have to hurry up and get finished. So um, the attention uh, really to the assembly and renovation and so on was to give everyone, the baptized who have roles in the liturgy, a place to move and walk and do their ministry, to be Eucharistic ministers, to walk up to the lectern, to do, you know, it. the travel patterns are so important in a church because we come out of the assembly to do our thing and we go back into the assembly. I wanted to say a little bit about the Liturgy of the Hours, but I'll just make it very short. That's where I've spent most of my time. I've been to many, many communities, helping them reform their liturgies, you know, uh, making books, finding their artists, their language people, their people who can who, uh, compose, and so on, and helping them see how they can make that book their prayer book. And women have done it a lot. I don't know so if the... Men have a lot, but I think so. We all went into reforming our books because we had English now and we were free to do it the way our community um, could be best served. And of course, uh, 
paying attention to the time of the day, creation, morning, evening, and so on, has made a big difference, I think, in the life of um, the monastery. So I'll just close by saying that even though in liturgy I can become kind of sad and almost depressed when I hear some of the things like the Lamb of God, you know, just last week you can't, I mean, just those little things that don't seem to, well, anyway. Um, I want to quote Mary Collins, who in the NCR said, we hope in the God who is always extravagant with unending love. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm assuming that the priests may probably be speaking more about the liturgy, so I'm going to say less about that because they celebrated pre-Vatican II. You didn't, but he did. I want to just say that um, next to my genetic inheritance, my family of origin, uh, my most significant relationships, probably my education, uh, my formation in my monastic community, there is nothing that has had a greater impact on my life than Vatican II. And I think I'm not alone in that. Now, I'm just curious, are, is there anybody in here who uh, was born after Vatican II? Would you raise your hands if you're there? Okay, I get that. The younger members in our community say, we're just getting so darn tired of it. I get it, but I need to tell you this, that because of Vatican II, the church will never, ever be the same again. It's a watershed. And I'd like to say maybe a little bit about how that was. And I'll give you just one small personal example. I did talk to about 15 sisters around meals, and I said, these are the questions, what would you say? And uh, mostly people will say, well, the change is in the mass. If you say to people, how were you most personally affected by Vatican II? I'm talking about older folks now, not you handsome young people. And they will all talk about Mass, and I, and I think that's true because they experienced it already. I will never forget December 4th, 1964. First Vespers of the first Sunday of Advent. We had had the Latin office all my life. I had been praying it for at least eight years. There was an English translation on one side, but we prayed in Latin. That night at first Vespers, we could pray in English. And I was in tears because I thought, for almost 10 years, you have been praying the Psalms. You don't know a single psalm by heart. So I just wanted to use that for you younger folks. And then I think I probably had a personal thing. In the summertime, we were still praying at St. Ben's, the full matins. And in June and July, there were umpteen three nocturne matins with 12 psalms or 24 psalms and I don't know how many readings. And I missed my bath every Saturday night. <laughs> I was so upset because it took an hour and a half, and we had these huge books, and everything was in Latin, so I had this huge book, and I was reading the lesson of Augustine on numerology and all that stuff, and I thought, what am I doing this for? So um, don't misunderstand, I also sang Gregorian chant and absolutely loved it, but those of you who are a bit older will remember that one of the things Vatican did, Vatican II did in the liturgy full participation act, if gave the people a voice at prayer. I went to mass from gra you know, grade school. I sang umpteen dies series and masses of the dead all my life. There was my mother and all these people, and while the priest was saying mass, they were praying the rosary and they had their devotional books. Now, they were holy people, but they had no voice. And I also want to say, musically, yes, right after Vatican II, the, the music was horrible. However, people at least were singing. We gave them their voice in church, and we gave musicians and hymn writers and so on uh, permission to, and now we have good hymns. So I'm not going to talk about the liturgy. I'm going to say, <laughs> well, see, a Benedictine has to talk about the liturgy. I want to say that I think that the most significant change was the church going back to recognizing the universal baptismal call to holiness of the laity. That's what it did, and the laity actually took it up. 
and they said, we believe it, and we are the people of God. We're the majority. This is not a democracy, but we are called. And it shifted even to, in its theology. It no longer said that the role of the laity in the church was only to help the bishops in their apostolic work, but in the, and that they should you know, bring the gospel to the world. Here's what it said. The laity have their own role to play in the mission of the whole people of God in the church and in the world. And this pope just repeated that on August 24th. Uh, he said, co-responsibility requires a change in mentality, particularly with regard to the role of the laity in the church, who should be considered not as collaborators, that's the old theology, with the clergy, but as persons truly co-responsible for the being and activity of the church. So he said, we need a mature and committed laity to be united, who are able to make their own special contribution to the church's mission. And what? In accordance with the ministries and tasks each one has in the life of the church. Okay, that is big time. Now the thing that happened, which I think a lot of bishops didn't expect, the laity took it on. And, 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 they, and I have great respect and trust. I think the laity, they're the majority. There's where my hope is. Not solely there. It's in the Holy Spirit, of course. Well, things changed. I mean, we finally had parish councils, but in a lot of places, they didn't have any power. Some places didn't have a parish council. Um, we still don't have venues for the laity to make their voices heard about how they see the church. I think that's sad. There are, in canon law, there's a provision for diocesan synods. Uh, and that the bishop can call, you assemble, there have to be laity there, they are to speak, which is like it was in the early church, where they had fist fights over whether Mary was going to be the mother of God or not. I'd like to see a few fist fights. I'm, not really. I'd like to see that much energy. But what has happened in the revised code of canon law, the bishop in the earlier code had to call a synod, diocesan synod, every so many years. Now, though they've enlarged the participants, it's left up to the discretion of the bishops, and they're not calling them. I looked it up in our diocese. The last synod was in the 1930s, and what they legislated on was Saturday night dances. <laughs> and they had to be over by midnight. Okay, so I think also what you got going on now, and I give the lady credit, on their own, since they're not being invited, to diocesan synods, they're forming groups. We know Voice of the Faithful, 10th anniversary. Uh, there's Call to Action. There's a Minnesota group called the Catholic Coalition for Church Reform, the Council of the Baptized, the Spirit of the Saints Stephen Catholic Community Church, the Future Church, the Progressive Catholic Voice. They're, those are all more liberal. They're also very traditional groups that don't like the council that are also active. But give them credit. They're speaking up. So the silent la la laity is not silent. They have come of age. That's enough on the church. Um, oh, one other area, sorry. Theology. If you look at the Catholic Society of uh, America and you count the number of lay theologians as a brand new phenomenon, it's not that we never had them, but we had few. It, we, they were mostly clergy. And as uh, you have that membership of 1,300 members, um, 442 are women, and I just want to say the contribution of laity, both lay men, lay women, globally, Asian, African, South American, Latin American, so on, the whole world of theology and the contributions of the lay theologians, incredible, and of women theologians. Okay, do I have any time? I'll shorten this one. I just want to say then, in terms of monastic life, I just want to say what, for me, the reclaiming by American Benedictine women of our authentic Benedictine monastic identity. We were not considered monastic. And in 1880, Bishop Olathorne in England wrote to an American Benedictine prioress, and he said, you do not appear to be true religious 
in the canonical sense of the term, but rather a pious institute bearing a Benedictine name. Now, he was really wrong by saying we weren't religious, but canonically he was correct. According to canon law, we were not monastic in 1880, because if you were a woman, you had to be enclosed, and we couldn't keep a strict enclosure. Although, let me tell you, walking across the street from Cathedral High School to the convent is pretty much enclosure. We never went anywhere else. <laughs> Going to the dentist with a sister sitting in the waiting room with you, you couldn't go to a movie or rest. I mean, we were keeping enclosure, but it, we didn't have a grill, so it didn't count. So we couldn't make solemn vows, and the divine office was taken away from us. So what I think was just incredible, and later in the question and answer, if you're interested, we were considered non-monastic. We were considered an apostolic order. But in the 1970s, after the Vatican Council, the Benedictine prioresses started to, we rewrote, all of us, we rewrote our documents. In the 1970 documents about your order, the word monastic appears once in the form of a question, if the term will ever be used again. In 1977, it's all over the place. And we just said, we are a monastic community living the Benedictine tradition. Well, why could we do that? Because we educated ourselves in all areas of theology, monastic studies. The Benedictine Institute of Theology sisters were sent on. We took responsibility for our own formation, and we took back, and we said, you don't think we're monastic. We've kept the rule central. We pray the divine office. We took it back. We live in community. Who are you to tell us we're not monastic? Now, that was big. Not everybody in my community wanted to be called monastic, and you can ask me later why. But in our own voice, we said what we were, and uh, we were confident in it, and it made a big difference. That's all I'll say. Simeon doesn't want to go before me, so uh, I will take his place. I'm going to speak about a revolution. Uh, I came to this community which was a very hierarchical, uh, structured community with an undercroft where you have the brothers. Now, I came as a brother and for 20 years lived under the uh, it was the upstairs, downstairs of the monastery. And uh, so uh, my whole monastic career has been one of this revolution that took over, that began really with the council. And the revolution was that the brothers, much like the, the uh, sisters, uh, were educating themselves. Uh, it was a wonderful group of people uh, that were intellectually curious, uneducated. Uh, very few of us uh, were encouraged to go on to schooling, and uh, uh, certainly our theological education was, well, to say basic would be a good, uh, basic was probably a little over the top, actually. Uh, it was go to prayer, uh, say your office, and we had a different office than the priests upstairs. Uh, ours was, uh, thank God, somewhat simplified, uh, but it was very, very regular. And as the whole life of the brother was regular. Um, the order of the house uh, was the abbot as the lord of the manor, uh, very much under Baldwin uh, this was the case, and you had then uh, the priests, the clerics, and then the brothers. And in this house, 
this living situation of, of the uh, people that make all the decisions uh, made them also for the brothers because we didn't, uh, I don't want to say that we weren't capable, but uh, it just wasn't in the uh, order as it had been established for uh, centuries. So there were rumblings downstairs. And with the Vatican Council, we were seeing uh, uh, the older monks in particular, were seeing that there was a terrible inequality. We were beginning to see that this inequality was really unacceptable. So the rumblings also with the clerics, um, they were an unruly bunch. And uh, these uh, clerics were, would, uh, at a certain times, to show their disfavor in the refectory, uh, would move their chairs around. Um, then uh, there were uh, other types. I think that uh, there was a stoppage for a while over one of the meals uh, uh, that uh, was in uh, trying to get the abbot's attention. Um, the brothers had come in late for uh, the meal because somehow our office went longer and the, uh, they had already had prayers and had started the meal. Now, you may not think this is significant. However, the abbot ate very quickly. And so when he was finished eating, that was the end of the meal. And so the brothers, uh, we had, I think it was like 10 minutes then to finish our meal. Uh, it was at that point that uh, a group of the elder brothers went to the abbot and said, we need some change. And it was from that point that we began working towards uh, having solemn vows, the same vows as the rest of the people in the community, and voting rights in the chapter. Um, it was also the prelude to being integrated into the choir upstairs. So here is, uh, are these people like Julius, uh, Father Julius and myself, um, who at the very beginning of the council live this monastic life uh, under Croft. Slowly though, with the revolution that takes place and the change of mentality in this whole community, uh, this became a whole community. We even had our mailboxes integrated. Uh, rather than the mailboxes of the priests on the first floor, the clerics on the third floor, and of course, where would the brothers be? <laughs> in the basement. And now everybody's in the basement. <laughs> uh, so, for, you know, I look at our monastic life and I say, it was not only influenced by the Vatican Council. The Vatican Council was a, uh, a, certainly a watershed moment, but it was also what was happening at that time throughout the United States. Um, so Father Godfrey and a few other people uh, would go to march in some of the, uh, the uh, uh, um, in Selma. They, they, there was a bus that went down. Human rights things, yes. And so when he came back, of course, people like Robin Pierzini, but he, he was not here yet, but people like that said, <laughs> <laughs> they, they would say, oh, sure, he can go to Selma, but he wouldn't lift his finger for the brothers. So there was tension in this monastic life, which wonderfully has worked itself out. Thank you.
Well, one of the reasons I wanted to go last was because I, I knew he'd say just about everything anyway, and so there was no need for me to over-prepare. You know. um, you weren't a brother. You couldn't talk about this. <laughs> I had a brother, remember? Oh, that's yeah. right. Yes. Um, I, I kind of started uh, taking notes under two categories, the old church and the new church. And the old church was that structure over there, and the new church was the present new church we have, which uh, opened just a few months before the Vatican Council did. So we had a sense of moving from old church to new church, physically and in many other ways as well. Um, I just will tick off some of uh, the, the changes that took place, because uh, many of our younger members I don't think could possibly believe that was the case. In the old church, um, the air never changed in the church. Um, the same air was there winter and summer, and it was highly tainted with incense, of course, and uh, so you walked in the door and whack. You hit the same air again, and you stayed there for another hour, and then you marched out. Um, in the new church, in the new church, there was fresh air. It wasn't always cool, it wasn't, but you know, and sometimes it was quite hot, but nevertheless, it was fresh. Um, in the old church, we had overflowing choirs. So if this was the altar, you had the two choirs over here, which were full, but then you had some 20 or 30 clerics sitting behind the altar, and um, when the brothers came to church with us, they were out in, this, in the nave of the church, of the old church. So we were really kind of overflowing. So when the new church came along, we had all kinds of room, and we have even more room now. Uh, uh, of course, the old church was Latin and chant. And we used to practice chant, some of us at least, uh, two to three hours a week. I mean, we memorized that stuff. And, and we liked it. And it was wonderful. But somehow or other, uh, after a few months uh, or so in the new church, it didn't quite fit what was coming. And there was a great dissatisfaction in the community that we weren't doing chant anymore. And, and the rest of this kind of thing, but I, I don't know what you could do about it, you know. Um, it just didn't fit. Uh, the English that was coming in. Um, in the old church, we started um, lauds at 4.45 in the morning. <laughs> and then we run into prime, terse, sex, known, and three, two masses. Everybody went to two masses. By that time, it's 6.30 in the morning. All right. The other three uh, hours of the liturgy were at um, uh, Vespers at um, 5.30, and um, Matins and Compline at 7.30. So um, we had the eight hours all squeezed together. See, And now, of course, we have um, three hours and one mass. And um, that seems to work better or make more sense anyway. Um, there are uh, things I'd like to um, kind of take off on uh, that Jerome was talking about because I think they're important. And I think one of the most significant um, changes for the better that came to this community um, through Vatican II was the fact that we got, a, got away from the two-class system, as he mentioned. And it was really a two-class system. Um, you, um, the brothers had lower-class housing. Um, the brothers in Stazio were first. We came as novices, and we couldn't figure out, what are we doing uh, lining up behind all these old brothers? They've been here 40 years already. We should be the ones in the front of the line, the newest people, see. So th there was some understanding, I think, even in, in the mid-50s when we entered the monastery, that there was something wrong with this whole two-class system. But it took a while, and it took Vatican II, really, to kind of shake things up enough um, to make it possible um, for us not to um, pray hier hierarchically and um, not to um, have our rooms hierarchically, and not to eat dinner hierarchically, which we did. Um, but we could finally get together kind of as one community with people um, choosing where they want to sit and whom they, they want to sit with and the rest of this kind of stuff. So it becomes a much more integrated kind of life all the way around. And one of the things I'd emphasize about that is also um, the brothers did get uh, education. and. Um, they get education just like everybody else gets education these days, and that was just not the case in those days, you know. And uh, you look back now and you say, what a strange arrangement. But um, 
that's uh, what we grew up with in the old church. And uh, it's, it's, the, it's the one great favor, I think, I would say, that Vatican II did for us um, uh, in our uh, men's monasteries in this country. About language, um, I had eight years of um, formal Latin and um, ten years of reciting Latin in the old church. And I thought I was pretty good at it. I couldn't understand why people would say that after this they didn't understand any Latin. I could translate it very easily. But then when you got into the new church, it was really kind of a revelation. And I think maybe you mentioned this? Yeah. And it's um, the fact that, yes, I was quite competent in translating the Latin, but I wasn't able to pray it. Okay? And there's a difference between translating something and praying it. And so that I was just kind of amazed as uh, we got into the English translations and the rest of it that I had never understood this was, was at all what we were saying. And yet I had all this background in Latin and uh, uh, felt pretty comfortable with it. But I felt comfortable enunciating it and translating it, but not praying it. And I, I think that's um, one of the things that um, changed life for me in the monastery. Um, Another thing I think is um, a different kind of understanding of the vows that have come out as a result of uh, Vatican II and um, the whole Benedictine community in this country going back to their roots and understanding uh, what the rule is and what the vows are. Um, I believe you could say that when I entered the monastery there was one vow. You took three, or maybe we took five, I don't remember. Um, but. Um, there was one vow that was always primary, and that was obedience. Shut up and do what you're told. And uh, this is the thing to do, and you do it. You do it, you do it. And it was a matter of obedience. It was your vow of obedience. I think as, as we came, became a little more mature in our understanding of our tradition and the rule, um, the uh, vow of conversatio becomes the most significant one. In other words, what is the monastic way of life? And uh, to some extent, um, even if nobody's telling you exactly what to do, um, what is it that monks do? You know, so it's, uh, I think that's one significant uh, change that I've noticed also. Um, uh, there are uh, other things that happened liturgical-wise that were kind of interesting. Um, um, and a lot of this had to do with priests. Um, one of the th big changes for priests was that uh, when we entered the monastery, 40 to 45 priests went out for parish service every weekend. The place just emptied out. And we had um, uh, 70 to 80 young monks uh, in training for um, the clerical life, and so we could carry on the choir quite nicely. But it was really an interesting thing, all those people abandoning the place on the weekend. Um, uh, another thing was um, that now we had to start preaching to our confreres. Oh, was that unnerving. All those people sitting there wondering what you're going to say and um, talking over the results after it was over. Um, not with you, of course. No, not with you, of course. But um, so this was unnerving. All of a sudden, we, we had had uh, conventional masses for 10 years when I was in the monastery, and no, but the priest never talked to anybody um, uh, at those masses. Um, retirement began to happen. Uh, usually, the older priests in the parishes just died where they were. Uh, but now, the um, idea of retirement and maybe coming home when you're uh, 85 years old um, began to, to take effect. And uh, this was really a, a new thing for us. Um, one of the things also was the Beretta Wars. I don't know if you remember the Beretta Wars. Uh, somewhere in the um, mid-60s or late 60s, there was a priest or other who would come into the conventional mass without wearing a Beretta. Well, I mean, who said that? Who, was, who said they could do that, et cetera, et cetera? So it became a question of whose side are you on, whether you wore a Beretta when you walked into the conventional mass or did not. See, and so these kinds of uh, stirrings of, of uh, 
conflict between what was and what is coming was uh, certainly there. Another one was the Tabernacle Wars. Um, especially on, on the university side, the Tabernacle kind of wandered around various places in the chapel, and uh, if uh, the, the uh, celebrant didn't like it here on the altar, he could place it over there, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, is this proper? Is you should move the Blessed Sacrament around? Um, and then, of course, there were balloon masses. Now, I, I never saw a balloon mass, and I, I don't, but this again was a university kind of thing, but I, I never attended one, but I heard about them, but I, I didn't think there were that many of them, but um, there may have been one or two, I suppose. But anyway, um, they must have been really something, and I'm sorry I missed them, because the wanderer is still talking about them. <laughs> So anyway, um, these were uh, various things that were going on, and uh, the, whole, the whole monastery changed. Our idea of recreation, our idea of silence, uh, um, various kinds of things, vacations, time off. We never had time off. Um, Abbot Elkwin used to say before we got in the monastery that a vacation was a change of work. <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, I think one of the uh, milestones in the, it was later in the 80s, I guess, that Brother Dietrich was named president of the university. Who would ever have thought in the 60s that a brother would be able to run the university, see? But these kinds of things are taking effect and, and moving through the community very nicely. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, questions that was raised by a, a woman author in a recent book was, a uh, troubling one. She says, is the religious life over in the church? And uh, this is uh, one of those things that's happened since Vatican II, too, you know, is the fact that somehow or other religious communities are shrinking. And um, she asked the question in her historical um, uh, study of religious orders, um, are they necessary anymore in the church? Will there be religious orders in the church after Vatican II? And um, that's really an interesting uh, question. Uh, I, I, I've never seen it in print before. I guess we kind of all live with it, but um, somebody actually saying it, and it was not a religious who was saying it. That uh, brings me back to my um, years at wor working in the prep school around 1968. I'd come back from studies where I got my master's degree in English, and so of course I was put to work uh, teaching religion. <laughs> And uh, it was difficult to find uh, good books about Vatican Council and the sacraments, but I, this was a sacraments class for sophomores, so 16-year-olds. And um, it was, um, we got to um, the sacrament of orders and stuff, and I said, well, now Vatican II has kind of changed our notion about uh, priesthood. I said, it's, it's not a matter of um, position or power or anything anymore. It's a matter of uh, serving the people. And one of the kids just blurted out, well, who would want to do that? <laughs> you know, and I, I thought it turned out to be somewhat prophetic. You know, it seems to be that there aren't just too many who want to do that. And, uh, but it was one of those uh, changes in terms of those of us who think priesthood, uh, the ordained priesthood, is, is really, I think, uh, a significant change as well. So there are other things I have here. Um, one of them is demographics. Uh, we had 70 or 80 people in our house um, between the age of uh, 20 and 30. I suppose you had two or 300 of them, okay? But, um, and I think, good grief. They must have driven all the older people crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they didn't because they were all segregated, uh, one group from another, and so you hardly had anything to do with each other. So. Um, it really is an interesting, um, amazing thing that has been going on in the church and in uh, the monasteries uh, since then. And um, I thank my uh, three companions here for uh, elucidating this for us. And um, we'll wait your questions or your rebuttals. Um, 
Well, my, my question is based on something that uh, Sister um, that Catherine, is it? Uh, that Sister Catherine said, um, but any of you can answer this. Um, she mentioned a, a number of um, uh, lay organizations and um, uh, liberal groups, and uh, as well as uh, there being, um, you know, some on the other side who don't like um, the, the changes that came from the council. Um, my own observation is that um, there's a lot of anger there um, between those sides and, and directed the, toward the, the whole church from both sides. And uh, to put it a little uh, more bluntly, um, it, ah, shoot, <laughs> okay, oh, let me not lose it. Um, <laughs> Holding on to this thought, um, that it, it, it seems to me that uh, there there are some of these groups on both side of sides of the polemic that seem to thrive on being always up in arms about one thing or another. Um, so, uh, do do any of you know of um, any? Uh, uh, lay Catholic groups, um, or clergy or monastics for that matter, um, that are um, more in the center, that are um, committed to living out the the spirit of Vatican II, um, more in a spirit of hope rather than of anger. Right there. This is Father Kira Nolan. Spent many years in Japan. I was ordained in 1959. I think I was the last priest ordained in that church over there. Mm -hmm. So I grew up there and I've been living in Vatican II here since 1959. But what I appreciate very much the question, I think that's exactly what I'd like to underline. And a place where we can have disagreements, where we can correct misunderstandings and move on. Mm -hmm and not gloss over the fact that some of our past in both communities maybe stepped on toes, maybe broke some arms, cracked some bones, but that we are able to get up and keep on going. The statistic I think you brought up, Sister, over 400 women in the Catholic Theology Society of America. I was a member of the society before there was any. Mm -hmm. There are now a total, something like 1,600 members of this. Mm -hmm. But that's where the brewing, the thinking, and we can boast quietly that one of our faculty, specifically Dan Finn, was mm -hmm. president yeah. of the Catholic Theology Society. Yeah. And what he's told them in his presidential address was, can we learn to be a little bit more respectful of one another? And while we can disagree, not to be harsh and denigrating. And let's repeat it again in other requests. Can we find a place where it's done? And maybe for ourselves, with the grace of God, we can model that for others. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? Very carefully, most patiently. Somebody came to me for spiritual direction one day and said, how do you, how do you, shh, 
share in the sufferings of Christ. I said it on the wall, in the concrete wall in the hallway, through patience, sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, other people can answer. I think your question is right on. But I would say there are people in this room, now they might not necessarily, Catholics, whom I know, I'm not going to point them out, they can speak if they want. They don't necessarily belong to any one of the groups that I mentioned. They are not completely happy with everything, but they're still going to church. They're still speaking up when they have time. They're still respectful. They are not using their uh, disappointment to become bitter. And I think that's what you were talking about. And I think this is true. We're seeing it in politics. Uh, we're seeing it in the book that somebody just wrote that we all tend to look at the news. The gre the, there's the Fox News people, and there's the MSNBC people, and there's the Rachel Maddow people, and there's the Bill O'Reilly people, and the CNN people, and we listen to each other. And all right, well, this isn't the church, but if you've listened to, uh, if you know who Krista Tippett is, she got a grant to, and it's called the Civil Conversations Project. And she is, I watched it. I listened to it on NPR. You can watch it on your computer. She brought together people on opposite sides of one of the most thorny issues in the church, the thing on abortion. And they talked about it, and they had a civil conversation, and they had a respectful conversation. And it grew out of... Um, there was a bombing of a Planned Parent clinic, clinic in Brookline, Massachusetts some years ago. Both the pro-choice and the pro-life people were so distressed. They met secretly for five years to talk to each other about why they are where they are on the issue. Now, we've got to learn how to do that in the church, and I think we need to hear, and that's why I said there are groups, Opus Dei's groups, or whatever you want to call them, the pious, the... 10th Christians and the pious, the five, fifth Christians. We have to learn to talk to each other uh, respectfully, but we aren't doing it. Well, what's the venue? That's really what we're talking about. Where are we going to do this? Um, and that, you know, maybe it's a silly thing, but theologians can also speak, and I think Dan Finn's point was right, but in a sense, the theologians, they have a voice, but uh, they don't have a venue exactly with the hierarchy. There's no, I don't think they're, they're talking as theologians and there's been a real gap between the theologians, you know, and there shouldn't be. There shouldn't be a gap between the theologians. And, and I think what happened at Vatican Council too, the theologians were doing what they should be doing, advising the bishops and there were theologians on all sides, which is why the documents are compromised documents in many places. But there were also, you know, there was progress. I'll keep still. But I'm saying we have to learn to do this, not just in the church, but in, you know, society. I think you might find that in many of your parishes, uh, people are discussing and speaking respectfully uh, and uh, voicing their, uh, their uh, uh, disapproval of a number of of issues. Um, the marriage amendment has, uh, in my parish, uh, uh, gotten a few people to uh, write to me about uh, they want to leave the church, but because of the Eucharist and because of the fact that uh, uh, this is their home, they, they do not want to. But they, they are s so upset by uh, what Archbishop Neinstadt has and his people have done. Um, and so you also have people in the parish who want to put a sign outside the church saying, vote yes for uh, the marriage amendment. Uh, and so uh, together, they worship together. Some of them even sit in the same pews. And uh, uh, they, I think th the age of and I, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I, I think the age of, of confrontation and simply breaking away as, as the uh, um, result of disagreement has stopped. 
uh, I think that, uh, uh, for example, Vatican II was a time, this place uh, aesthetically uh, is sublime, it was, uh, and so many good things uh, architecturally and artistically happened here. Vatican II, however, allowed certain pastors to go into their churches and uh, sell all of the statues and everything in them, uh, much to the chagrin of many of the parishioners who then left and uh, went to Rockville, for example, uh, back to a real Catholic church. Uh, so those types of wars, as you were saying, uh, they were really uh, very, very difficult for the laity and uh, the clergy still at that time was holding on to power so that as a priest I could go into the church that I have and simply uh, uh, get rid of everything without really consulting. Now, um, I wouldn't even dare pick a hymn. <laughs> David or Orteska is here. He was my, my liturgy director. <laughs> I hope you give us a little consideration from the floor because I think we have a lot of questions to ask, right. really. So, um, I think a good response to that will be to see love in terms of a non-violent apprehension of differences, really. Um, what I was concerned about, really, is to see I know that St. John's, you, you, your main focus is perhaps on the University of St. John's. And I, I think the, the nuns will be on St. Benedict's College, really. But when I walk through the corridor of the buildings, I see other photographs of different works that were involved in the community that used to be involved in the earlier days. Like, you know, I see there were a lot of cattle here, there were, there were farm here at one time, I, I assumed, really. Do you see that, um, that the, the, the focus of your work as Benedictines um, are, are evolving and changing. Um, and do you see that maybe in the next 20, 20 10 years perhaps, to be more realistic, that you would no longer be running a university, for example? You'd be doing something else? I don't know, really. I'm asking how do you see the, ev the, the whole evolution of Vatican II in the context of getting engaged in different work, really? Here. Um, we've seen a big change already at the uh, um, monastery, at St. Benedict's Monastery. We have very few sisters working in the college. Uh, we have no sisters teaching in grade school. We used to have 52 grade schools. Um, we don't have anybody teaching in high school, do we? Jean Marie, yeah, one in elementary. Oh, I missed that one. But there is a big change. And uh, I know in our community, uh, we have changed our focus a lot to hospitality. Uh, when we renovated our church, our sister Evan was the prioress, and she said, you know what? We're going to open the door to the public and that's going to turn us around. We didn't have a front door to our chapel. So now she said it's going to turn us around too. And it has. Our main uh, ministries now are more in the line of hospitality, wouldn't you say? And uh, spirituality and we never, most of our sisters were never involved in the college. You have to remember when I came to the monastery, we were over a thousand. And there were only like 150 at the monastery. It's always been that way. And so we evolved into ministries a long, long time. Most of our sisters were teachers, nurses, housekeepers. We had a farming operation. We had crafts. We had 
printing presses, we have artists, we have musicians. There's a lot, fewer of us, but it never was the College of St. Benedict. That was not the ministry for most of us. So, and we have evolved, then we got out of Catholic schools and we became parish administrators and faith formation directors and um, hospice nurses and hospital chaplains. We've done everything. And we now are evolving into, as she said, the monastery. There are many, more, fewer of us, retreats, spirituality, spiritual direction, mm -hmm. and many other things. I, I never went to a balloon mass, <laughs> but I graduated from eighth grade in 1966. So I went through high school post Vatican II. And I can remember uh, masses back then where we'd sing Puff the Magic Dragon as an opening hymn. <laughs> and uh, and for, the, for the Eucharist, there was Frito corn chips and a can of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, <laughs> uh, or sometimes hot dog buns. But uh, um, in all seriousness, I'd like to ask each, each of you to just think for a moment and if Pope Benedict called a council next week, um, there were 16 documents issued in Vatican II uh, on a broad range of topics. Education, there was one on priest and then priest formation, ecumenism, and then one on non-Christian churches. So they, they tried to cover everything. But if he called a council next week, what would each of you think should be on the hit list of documents and topics to be covered? Did they cover everything in Vatican II, or did they leave some things out? Um, and I'd like to ask each of you, what would you consider the top three issues or topics that should be covered in the next council? Maybe it, it's going to be Chicago One. <laughs> Um, I've been thinking some time for, for this, and I, one of the things, just looking at the, the church in general, I think that one of the things we need is um, a council that deals with wealth. What is wealth? The whole issue of distribution of wealth in our, in our world and the rest of this kind of stuff. So um, what is the Christian concept of wealth, and what, what is the Christian responsibility for wealth? Um, secondly, I would also think that... Um, since the sexual revolution of the 60s, we just really have to have some kind of serious look at the whole issue of sexuality um, in our societies and in the world. Thirdly, I think one of the things they, the uh, first uh, the Vatican Council did was it talked about priests and talked about religious, but it didn't put them in the sense of, of, the, emerging, of the emerging laity. So the laity has emerged, and what has happened to priesthood and religious life? There was no real redefinition or de redescription of what uh, priesthood and religious life were in the church. And I think we're all kind of hurting for that. So I would like to see um, a whole fresh look at the, those three aspects of things and some serious rethinking in terms of um, economic theory and economic reality. and. Um, uh, human, the human sciences and the rest of this kind of stuff to find out um, really what is it as modern day Christians and Catholics um, we want to say these three things are about. Great, Simeon. One more, I'm not, I'm not going to say three because he said a lot of mine, but collegiality. I think we ought to talk about collegiality and get some of this hierarchy, Lord, um, you know, uh, levels thing worked out. My first was the church and the poor. I put that first because I just think it's the most basic, fundamental gospel call. And even though some peace have given, uh, popes have given critiques about certain forms of capitalism. Uh, we haven't listened to that. It's, and you, we all know the gap between the rich and the poor. It's gotten worse. So I put that as my first. Um, 
then I, my second was, we are losing a lot of the young generation. Uh, I just read today that 10% uh, of Catholics who have left the church could be the largest, one of the largest denominations. There's so many of them. Um, so what is this about? I mean, do we know why they're leaving? Do we care? Have we addressed it? Do we want to go with what I hear and it horrifies me? Well, we just want a pure church. If they don't li like the church, well, let, let them leave. We've got to listen. And so my thing about how can we bring together the people who are leaving and would rather not leave? I mean, what are, what are the avenues for giving voice to the people who want to be Catholic, and it's in their DNA, and the younger generation, and so on. How are we going to evangelize? Then another one, I think, enculturation, and you know, even about the liturgy, I think it's still so Roman and so formal. And we've got to listen to the Asian and the African bishops and the Malaysian bishops. You know, e even if you look at the diocesan synod in Rome, the agenda that the Asian and African Malaysian bishops was completely different from the American and the European. They were more into doctrinal things and in churchy stuff. These people were into violence, war, poverty, peace, trafficking, and enculturation. And I think you can't just say, let the Africans dance and play drums and the liturgy will be just fine. It's just not that what they're saying and they're leaving in addition to some, and you know, the other thing that bothers me is that we call every form of dis uh, d disagreement dissent. And we talk about cafeteria Catholics. I hate that because it's a, there are some cafeteria Catholics from on all the spectrums. Well, the Hevites think if it's not Pius V Mass, it's not legitimate. Okay, uh, if you don't accept contraception, whatever your issue is, why are you disagreeing? Cafeteria suggests it's a matter of personal taste. While that may be the case for some people, it's not for a whole other people who have significant concerns about issues, and we absolutely have to deal with them. We're losing people that we don't need to lose, and we're lo losing lots of good folks. Are you at peace? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> By, uh, I was surprised, being the last chair, I thought that each one of these people would say the role of women in the church. Um, to me, the, the role of the sexes uh, in our society and, uh, 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 and, and how the men and women uh, participate within the church is uh, absolutely vital. The second one, I guess, um, w I would like to see something on uh, families, violence, uh, and the problems of war, uh, of how th that the church should be responding uh, and helping in those particular issues uh, as the Christian communities are being stamped out throughout the world uh, w when their neighbors are uh, Muslim or other uh, Hindu, uh, etc. So uh, th those are the issues that I would uh, also like to see decided. Well, that was a good question. not a panelist, I'd like to add one. Uh, and that is uh, Jesus in the New Universe story. This whole idea of science affirming ancient wisdom is so exciting. Uh, Thomas Berry and, and Cletus uh, Wessel's book, Jesus in the New Universe. And I think if, if uh, and the Pope has mentioned some of this, if we could really start to understand Jesus' message in terms of how the whole universe is emerging. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love a statement by uh, Spong, who is very controversial, but he says, um, 
we are not sinful, we are emerging. <laughs> We're not quite human yet, but that's what Jesus came to teach us, how to be more human. I think the young people would start to uh, bleed and come back and, and all that stuff. My name is Andy Jilani. I, I'm originally from Pakistan. I'm a Catholic, and I want to uh, reflect and ask you a question about the universality and the prophet, prophetic voice of the church in these times. And by these times, I mean um, the multi-religiosity. The, there are certain religions who are marginalized, both in this country and in, in many countries. Uh, the drone attacks on Pakistan. Um, where is the prophetic voice, whether it is influenced by Vatican II or, or through current reflection and action, where is the prophetic voice of the church when it does not talk about drone attacks on Pakistan and Afghanistan? Recently, on, Septem on uh, September 11th, there was some Sikh, a Sikh uh, there was an attack on a Sikh temple uh, in Wisconsin, and people were killed. A friend of mine approached a very progressive Catholic church in the city and said that, oh, we should have a discussion. And the leader of that group said, oh, what is Sikh? So I want you to reflect and, and, and see in these times, where is the voice of the church? Uh, may I uh, say something about that only? I, and the response is that I think the church has learned from Archbishop Tutu, for example, in uh, how he proposed resolving the issues of South Africa uh, in the truth, uh, uh, what is it? Truth and, truth and reconciliation definition. Um, there is that I have a feeling that if you were to ask the uh, American Catholics, uh, we would be embarrassed to say, uh, because most of ours, our hierarchy at this point, would be talking about lace uh, or other issues of what they should wear uh, for their, uh, I mean, that's, a, I'm, I'm being humorous maybe, uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, our, our hierarchy is woefully unaware of the rest of the world or seemingly unaware. I think maybe things have been said, you know, by popes, like even in, in the document on world religions, but it's such a such a minor, I mean, people don't even know what the document says. I think, yes, Western, especially Americans, woefully ignorant about Islam, don't have a clue about what, the, you know, what that religion is really about, uh, have fears because of the terrorism. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It real And prejudices that are very, very real, have never met a Muslim, have never been in a mosque even though we have more and more mosques, and Minnesota has 150,000 Muslims, I think more than any other state in the Union. So I think things have been said about, even about war. I mean, the, the council, I mean, the document in the Church of the Modern World talks about war. It doesn't talk about drones, but it talks about nuclear war. And uh, popes have said, you know, Pacham and Terrace and all these, and even the bishops, uh, U.S. bishops, it, right after Vatican II, they wrote a, doc wrote a document on peace and all of that. And uh, the, the, the doctrine is there, the theory that modern warfare, uh, the old just war theories don't work anymore and all that kind of stuff. I don't know uh, if the Pope has spoken up about, you know, what happened in Pakistan or not. He very, very, very well may have, but I don't know who's listening. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe he has not. I would 
just respond to your question about about the moral authority of the bishop. I, I think that uh, there, there are an enormous number of really good bishops right now. Good, good, wonderful men. However, however, their voices aren't usual right now because of the incredible centralization of authority with respect to uh, the Roman Curia right now. That's one thing that's happening.